fair to start with the name of the men, the men actually chose it themselves who built the bridge, bring the Scottish word for bridge. We got involved because we were, um, we were a research group in South Queensway. Uh, we were asked to identify the names of the men who died for the memorials. And you might see them, there's one which you pass the car park coming in here, and there's one in near the, the Hawes Inn. So Bernardo's has asked us to just give you a brief talk about the bridge to enhance your experience of going up on the Fife cantilever, which is uh, this one here. So we need to go back in time to understand the bridge. Back to the 1870s, the 1880s, there was no internet, no computers, no GPS positioning as they used on the new bridge, uh, and no computer aided design. How they built that, this bridge has got everything at funny angles, how they managed it. So, work started in 1878, and not on the bridge you're going up to, but on this one. And this uh, was a suspension bridge designed by Thomas Bouch. And it was going to be 550 feet high. That's taller than the road bridge. He, he was a, a very well established railway engineer, Thomas Bouch, even though Portville Pier, uh, which is now gone, of course. He built the T Bridge, that was the longest bridge in the world. Um, and Queen Victoria crossed it, she was very impressed with it, and she, he, he got a knighthood. But it was a bit early. A few months later, as you probably know, as a train was crossing in a very stormy night, the bridge collapsed, taking the train and 75 lives with it. So this really dented the uh, reputation of railway engineering in Britain. And you can imagine the traveling public, hundreds of thousands of bridges across Britain, made this happen to me. They stopped work on his bridge, but when you're up there, have a look uh, at the Inchigarvi cantilever, you'll see uh, Thomas Bouches, all was built, there's a little pier and it's got a, a light on top of it. They then, the railway engineers got together from the four companies and they selected John Fowler and Benjamin Baker to build not just the strongest and stiffest bridge in the world, but a bridge that would look strong to restore the confidence of, of people. And I think when you look at the bridge, it looks pretty strong. So the design they chose was a cantilever and central girder. A cantilever is a bracket, or, sorry, a beam held at one end. And if you've got shelf brackets uh, like these at home, that's a cantilever. If you put two together, you've then got three, three double cantilevers. Uh, the central girder is, is the, the little bit in the middle. There's all sorts of complicated reasons that we haven't got time to go into today to explain that. The maker uh, did build things like the London Underground, they were marvellous engineers, very competent, and their bridge is still standing today. Of course, they have to start with foundations. Six of the 12 foundations, four for each cantilever, had to be built underwater to get to 90 feet, and that's a very difficult thing to do. Fortunately, they had a recently uh, invented thing, the pneumatic caisson. This is a caisson here. So imagine a huge cup turned upside down, 70 feet in diameter, with a seven foot compartment at the base, and that was for the men to work in. So they could then excavate down into the river, goes into the riverbed, fill up the concrete, and you've got your foundation. So it's a very clever device. But you have to keep the water out. So they had to use compressed air. And working in compressed air, what happens? Uh, the bends, exactly. They called it case on sickness. They didn't know what it was. We now know it's <coughs> bubbles of nitrogen very painful condition if you've ever been dying at the bench. The caissons were built uh, near the Hawes Inn, if you know Queen's Ferry, and they were launched like ships. Lady Aberdeen launched the first one. Uh, they were floated in position and then uh, work started on them. They were the designers, but who built the bridge? Well, it was William Arrow. Now, he is an incredible guy. Uh, he left school at the age of nine, three years education. He worked in a cotton mill as a scavenger, that's the lowest level job. Fortunately, he managed to get a job training as a blacksmith. But he ended up with one of the most successful, biggest engineering companies that did jobs all over the world. And he, in his spare time, he was an MP. I mean, incredible guy. And he wasn't just a builder, he was a designer in his own right. He designed, he loved designing machines, and we'll see a few of these. So um, they built up the towers first, and then that allowed to build out the cantilevers. By 1890, the bridge was uh, just about finished, so they decided 
right, the directors will have a jolly. If you know any directors, they'd love to have a jolly. And we'll have a train just for us going across the bridge. So who was the first train driver to cross the fourth bridge? It was this lady, the Marchioness of Tweeddale. She drove the first train across. We don't think she was wearing this train <coughs> when she went across. Um, her husband, uh, her, well, her name was uh, Can Candida Louise Hay, no relation to me. Um, her husband was the Marquis, uh, but he was also the chairman of the North British Railway. She, she was quite a plucky lady, she was involved in all sorts of things. Uh, two months later, the Prince of Wales arrived. The Prince of Wales arrived again, a special train. It was a dreadful day. You're fortunate, you're going up on a reasonable day. It was uh, always it was a, a storm. So they're all dressed up there. He got a special train out to the special platform, and he had a special lever to close the last special rivet. And it was, people think it was a gold rivet, and I don't think it would have lasted long uh, up in the bridge. Uh, it was soft metal so that uh, the hydraulic riveter could just close it like that. He, <coughs> that was the bridge officially opened. He then jumped back in the train and they went off for a fabulous meal back at the works. The statistics of the fourth bridge are as incredible as the bridge itself. So it's the world's first steel bridge and it's Seaman Martin's steel. And it had only just been approved by the Board of Trade. It was the Board of Trade who looked after this sort of thing. And it had also been approved by the Royal Navy for battleships. So good stuff. It's got two spans. It's, the length of bridges isn't that brilliant. It's really the span of a bridge that matters. And the biggest span, I think, was the Britannia Bridge in, in Britain when they were building this, 460 feet. This has two spans of 1,700 feet. So it, it was a very, a very brave thing to do to come up with this radical design and build a much bigger bridge than anybody had built in terms of span. What else have we got? Uh, 54,000 tons of steel. Now, that, that's the weight of five Eiffel Towers or 3,000 double-decker buses. If you put all the steel plates together, it would stretch for 40 miles. And um, that's the distance to Glasgow, which is very appropriate because that's where the steel came from. 73 men died, uh, men and boys. There were 4,600 uh, employed in the bridge. Um, budgeted for 1.6 million, cost three, three and a quarter million. Uh, they had to restore the bridge eventually. Health and safety prevented them painting the old way. There was a 10 year restoration program you probably saw. They had to use scaffolding. And they used paint that's used on, on the oil rigs in, in the North Sea. So that's fine. 2015 it was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site because it is just a fantastic bridge. You're going up in the Fife cantilever, very briefly. Um, this is the huge manufacturing site above Queen's Ferry where everything was made. So they brought in the steel plates from Glasgow in the big sheds, they bent them into shape, big round tubes, and they then put them on this drilling rig. Uh, again, Arrow developed, well, we need to speed it up, we invent a drilling machine, we could drill 10 holes at the same time and move along the rails. That's why it's called the, um, the drill roads. Um, once you had the plates in place, uh, you could take them by ship out to the Fife cantilever, and then build them up in this column. When you've got the column, it's a 12 foot diameter uh, tower, a tube, and you could actually get a single decker bus inside it. Uh, again, Arrow wanted to speed it up, so he invented this riveting machine, and it, it uses hydraulic riveting. You can either use hydraulic rivets, riveters to close rivets, or you can use the, the hand team, uh, hand, handmade team, uh, they actually use hammers. Uh, four man team, two boys, uh, you could be as young as 13, you left school at 13, you started work, no teenagers in those days, and then two men, so there would be a rivet heater, a rivet catcher, he would throw it to the rivet catcher, a hudder up or holder up, he held the rivet in place, and then the riveter, uh, he's the boss, he would close the rivet. Um, as the big plates that were made there uh, were drilled, they came out and lifted up by crane onto this platform. And their job was to bolt these in place. Uh, this uh, riveting cage was held underneath, <coughs> suspended, and then they jacked this up. So that the bolted plates were then riveted. Uh, bolts were only used temporarily because bolts could come loose with the vibration. Once the towers were, were finished, you could then build out the cantilevers. 
And you can see we've got um, two girders have been bolted together. We've then used the rivets here, and their job now is to replace those bolts with, with rivets. Again, um, Arnold came in. They recognised that the, the coal furnaces, like this little model here, um, were quite dangerous. Think of all that wood and hot burning coals. The coals go, and there was actually a fire in the bridge. So Arnold just invents the oil fired uh, furnace um, using compressed air. And, but that was also much quicker, you know, 200 rivets an hour. In the background, you can see the big thatch I mentioned uh, with two big sheds, the drill roads. And down here you've got all the workshops, the, uh, the joiner's shop, the carpenter shop, the, um, and don't forget the granites, the, what's the granite, and so on. Hey, Jenny. Thank you.